Good morning. We have high speed Wi Fi this time, so hopefully there won't be any issues and I can respond to the chat um, more in real time. So, good morning, Philip. Welcome. It's a new student that signed up a couple days ago, um, also from South Korea. So, thanks for spending your Sunday evening with us. So for those of you that are here, um, feel free to tell us how your stuff is going. Um, I'd imagine at this point, you've inoculated something, you've cloned something, um, and I would love to hear how it's working out for you. So I'll show you um, examples of what stuff should look like after a week or two of doing them. But um, yeah, I wanna know how all of this stuff is working out for you guys. Hello, Samin. And as I said in the email, this is the last class. So I'm going to do my best to have a good chunk of time left uh, before 11 a.m. CT so that we can have discussions about things. Um, I'll be available via email after the fact. So this is by no means like your last chance to ask questions, but you know, probably a, a, an efficient way to ask would be now or um, at the end of class. So yeah, we'll give a couple minutes for people to roll in. Um, we've got 15 now, that's pretty good. I'm gonna grab some water. If anyone's done cloning, how, how's it going? Good morning. <clears throat> All right, well, I'll show you guys. Um, last week, we did some inoculations, or um, we, we showed you how to make the bricks ready to be inoculated. Um, most of your stuff was probably not ready at that point, but by this week, if you did do your grain inoculations the first day, if you followed along with that demo, you should have some stuff that's usable now, um, which you can even wait longer if you'd like. Uh, so for example, <clears throat> this is the bag I did in the demo. Uh, this is the Ganoderma and it's pretty fluffy and white. You know, there is still areas that can use some colonization. So I am going to wait but you could expand it now if you wanted to. It is probably best to, it's, it's definitely best actually to um, let the rye completely colonize because your spawn is gonna be really robust and you're gonna get the most amount of biomass that you can um, into your bulk substrate. And um, I should have mentioned this last time, but with these bags, if you don't cut them open, um, they kind of remain this like vacuum sealed tightness. And if the filter pad is up against the plastic like this, the gas exchange is limited. So what you can do if your bags aren't growing as well, just, you know, separate the, the sides and like do your best to have maximum exchange between the filter and the rye. And one thing you can even do, and I'm going to just show you what I've done in the past, break up the rye and like get it more dispersed in the bag like this. Um, so there's more surface area exposed. And yeah, you know, it's, it's good to do that to your mycelium as well. It will uh, obviously break up that network a lot, but then when it's recovering, it'll 
get to more areas that it wasn't necessarily able to before. Um, if you grow mushrooms on a substrate and don't ever break it up, and then you did like a cross section of it, you would see that there's a lot less mycelium in the middle, and that has to do with gas exchange. So um, this is one way that you can get it to be more uniform. Um, glad your oyster mushrooms are looking good. Um, yeah, that's, that's probably the one that would grow the fastest of all the three that you got in your kit. Um, another thing that was uploaded last week, but we didn't demo in the class, was how to take your agar clones and put those into a grain bag. So that's on YouTube. It's in the Google Classroom um, materials list for week two. And this is what mine looks like now. So I did this on the 11th. I just dropped a little piece of agar in there and um, it's got this nice little white colony. So does anyone have questions on those two really basic inoculations or anything about your grain? Okay, well today we're gonna talk about the state of mycology in biotech and some of the stuff that people are doing with fungi in biotech. And there's a lot of really inspiring stuff. Uh, so I hope that inspires some of you to consider working with fungi in more novel forms. Um, and then the last demo is going to be how to take your inoculated substrate, which none of you will have be at that phase yet. Um, this class is three weeks long, but the whole the culminations of all of your fungus, that's going to take probably months, um, maybe about two months to get everything fully grown out. Um, so just, you know, be patient. You'll have access to the demos and the lectures after the fact. Um, yes, it is a slow practice, a slow grow. Could you pee, put a piece of agar into a broth? Totally. So that's how you make liquid culture a lot of the time. Yeah. Okay, does anyone have questions before we dive into the lecture? No. Okay. So. I decided to talk about this from the top down. So we're gonna go big to small, how people are using mushrooms, this like very tangible macro scale thing down to uh, the molecular level. Um, this is one of the Ganoderma strains that we have. You didn't get this particular set of genetics, but it does very similar things. And this is grown out in a vase and you can just get these really interesting uh, formations. And I'll show you some of that at the end of the class. But this is less tech and more just like fun facts, but to basically illustrate that the mushroom itself does have function. It does have potential in the real world. Um, and this is a really great fungus. I've used it to make paper. Uh, you can soak it in water and then use standard paper making protocol and get really great um, like white, whitish, tannish color paper material from it. But its pedestrian name is the tinder conch because if you light it on fire, it won't burn, but it will make embers. Um, so it won't hold a flame, but that will hold its, its embers and do like a slow burn for hours. I mean, you have to put effort to putting it out. Um, I've like had to run those mushrooms under water to get it to stop. But the great thing about this is that you can carry embers with you. So this is kind of, you know, um, if you've heard of Utsi the Iceman, uh, he's the oldest wet mummy that they found. They found this mushroom on this, this corpse, this mummy. And um, presumably people in the past have used this mushroom to carry embers with them. Um, 
And that's just interesting, you know, this is an organic material that's behaving this way. What can we learn from that? How can we emulate this? Uh, the Tinder Conk has also, you can make like a leather material from it. Uh, there's a video on this slide. So if you go to the Google Classroom, click on these slides and then look at the notes, um, you can see a YouTube video of people, I believe in their, they're in Romania, and they treat these mushrooms um, and, and then kind of beat them into this textile form and get this really solid material. And these are very minimal processing of mushrooms. Um, and, and more of the DIY world, people make dyes from them. Um, you know, polypores like the tinder kong, like this really tough mushroom. Those are great materials for paper. Anything tough like that. Um, Boletes are mushrooms you're going to find in really woodsy forest areas, especially in the Rocky Mountains. And they're really colorful mushrooms. You can get all sorts of colors from them. So uh, here's an example of a color chart that has come from a variety of just mushrooms. And this is just treating them with a mordant and um, really basic chemistry. And you're able to get um, some beautiful, wide-ranging colors. And yeah. So moving on to mycelium, where things get a little more tech. Um, let's see, I'm checking on questions. You're seeing the wrong image. I'm seeing an agarose gel chamber. Oh, interesting. Is no one seeing the slides? Can you guys see the slides now? There was a delay I've noticed. Sometimes I'll change the slide and then um, It'll take a good 30 seconds for it to actually populate on your end. Is it okay? All right, great. Not for you, James, but for you, Samid, okay. Um, yeah, I don't know, this is, this is all I've got. Okay, well, you'll have access to the slides, whether or not they populate, so um, they're on and off. Yikes, that's weird. Um, okay, well, let's just roll with it and um, see if it improves over time. Okay. Sod. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so mycelial applications, and this is something that many of you have probably heard of before, but people are using fungi as a binder in um, agricultural byproducts usually, but there's a variety of materials you can use that the fungus will colonize and create this composite material. There are a few people who are using mycelium just for the mycelium itself. Um, that's a lot trickier because generally when people use just mycelium for a material, you've got to treat it and do something like a cross-linking because by itself, it is kind of this soft, flimsy material. Um, but combined with other things, you can get, you know, very kind of low-tech applications with fungi and composites to create something truly viable. And I wanted to point this out because mushrooms, if, when you grow enough, you'll realize that they do respond to their chambers. So for example, if you were to fruit mushrooms in a bag that was tightly closed and it couldn't express the morphologies and phenotypes that it wants to, like a cap and stem, it's gonna still figure out a way to fruit, but it'll fruit up against the bag or whatever you know, geometry that it has to work with and that's interesting, like you, you could play with that. And I'll show you some things that we've seen in the lab um, where mushrooms are responding to these confined spaces. And I think that there's potential there for something in the future. But um, when it comes to really like playing with fungi and attempting to subject them to a certain geometry, mycelium is going to be more forgiving, more fluid. And part of that has to do with the high floor orientation. 
because mushrooms are predetermined. They have a morphology that they are wanting to accomplish. You know, all of these cells are in this striation form. They don't want to create these networks that you see in mycelium. So mycelium is really great. It's like extremely moldable. Um, you know, you can get it to grow in all sorts of shapes as a whole. So I uh, wanted to illustrate that. Um, these are pure mycelial materials. So Ecovative is probably one of the biggest biotech companies working with mycelium uh, right now. And, you know, they're pretty great. I've toured their factory. They provide a lot of the stuff that they create to the public, um, or at least more so than most biotech. So you know, I respect them. And um, they've created this foamy material, which is really great to touch. Um, I have a few samples here at the Odin, and it reminds me of um, like those toe separators or, you know, foamy materials like that. And this is pure mycelium, you know, with CO2 and a few other environmental conditions, you can get, you can coax the mycelium to grow up and out like this. And it's really exciting. So, there's a team at NASA that wants to make fungal bricks for building materials when Mars is colonized. Yes, uh, Lynn Rothschild is on this team and I tried to get in contact with her so many times, but it's cool. It's it's a great material because it's so lightweight um, and doesn't require a long time to grow it. You know, it's biodegradable and Ecovative is probably generating materials like this in a couple weeks, if that. Um, composites, like we've talked about. So this is when you take some sort of aggregate, generally a cellulose-based byproduct, like hemp holes, um, straw, anything like that, and you use mycelium to kind of glue it all together. And you can get some really durable material from this. Um, people have made structures out of it. It's really lightweight. It's pretty strong. Um, here's another example. They are definitely flame resistant. I've tried to torch stuff that I've grown and it doesn't catch. Uh, it's strong too. So the jar on the right, this is a liquid culture made with the same genetics as um, the material found on the left. And I went out of town, didn't spin my liquid cultures, didn't agitate them. And if you don't do that to fungal liquid cultures, they'll just start to form one big network. And that's what happened on the surface of this liquid. And it bound to the walls and I kept this jar upside down overnight just to see if it could hold that weight and it totally did and it was really exciting. So that level of imperviousness was impressive to me. Um, and that's partially because they're really hydrophobic and they float and it's great. Uh, this person made a canoe out of the ecovative material. It's probably one of the more exciting applications that I've seen. A lot of people are using it in like interior design stuff, uh, packaging, insulation, even sound panels. Uh, people are attempting to get the acoustics of this material to um, be competitive with you know, sound, sound panels that are made of foams that are not so good for the environment. Okay. Textiles and leathers. So this is, whoops, this is another thing that's mostly mycelium, but it requires a lot of treatment. And this, there's a big gap between the, the tech world that's able to produce these myco leathers and textiles and the, you know, DIY community that's making this itself. With the composites, it's pretty easy to recreate. Um, you know, you, you can take, you can either buy a composite from Ecovative grind it up yourself and add it to your own media and it will continue to colonize. It's not too different from standard mushroom cultivation. The leathers and textiles, however, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of 
disconnect. And that's something that we want to change and help make available to people. There's an awesome Discord that I encourage you to join if you are interested in growing this kind of stuff. Um, but essentially, they're engineering or in encouraging the fungus to really express that mycelial weaving. So as you saw in the picture before, um, it's kind of like felting, you know, it's a very matted, um, involved matrix. And that creates great structure for a leather-like material. But it does require some cross-linking and that chemistry can be difficult to do green. Um, and the whole point of creating these textiles and leathers out of mycelium is to get rid of the animal part, right? Because, you know, there's a variety of issues that consumers have with uh, cow or animal leathers. But one of them is definitely the environmental factor and then trying to create this while being more eco-friendly um, with chemistry, I've heard has been difficult, but they're getting really good at it. Uh, Mycoworks is probably the startup that's gotten the farthest with this stuff. Um, they're going straight to like high end fashion, you know, Stella McCartney and things like that are now using this material, but it'd be great to start seeing this in more fast fashion. Okay, no questions. And it's, you, you can kind of like grow mycelial yourself on liquid culture. You can solid state ferment, which is just a way of saying that you grow it like in a tray or something, and um, it will make like a small film of mycelium with proper CO2. And as we've discussed before, it will mold into whatever geometry you subject it to. So here's some examples where Phil Ross, I believe, from Mycoworks has put basically little textures on um, these sample micro leathers and it uptakes the texture really nicely. Um, but yeah, it does require some chemistry. So here's some basic stuff that I was able to find from the internet. And we will have a fabricating with fungi class eventually from the Odin and uh, we're hoping to provide a kit where you can grow your own myco material and um, begin treating it to be something that sticks around for a longer period of time. Food tech is also big right now. Um, corn's been around for a long time. I'm sure you guys have seen this at the grocery store. This is like single cell protein, which it's basically just a, that's, that's a microbe that you can eat as kind of like a meat, but it's a microbe, you know? So you can ferment it. It's um, something you can grow in a bioreactor. And the protein content of this fungus, it's Fusarium something, it's just a mold fungus, is really on par with a lot of meat products. And corn has done a pretty good job at making like, uh, faux meat products and commercializing them. They're part, kind of the OG myco meat. And this is a very direct application of fungus in food tech. You're eating the fungus itself. Uh, the picture you see on the left is from Ecovative. They have another daughter company called Atlast. And they're using mycelium like a scaffolding to grow meat cells in. So you know, lab-grown meat. One of the problems with lab-grown meat is getting it to be in a three-dimensional form. You can grow it out on a petri plate, two-dimensional. It's relatively easy. It's like standard cell culture. But then getting it to look like a cutting of a meat, to look like or have the same striations that you would with like a cut of pork leg or something like that, that's, that's really what they're trying to do now is use mycelium to mimic that fiber structure that you would get in meat and then have the cells colonize that um, that matrix and you end up with a cut of meat that looks a little more realistic so they've been fun to follow uh, 
uh, proteins as well. So they've actually got enough fungus to make a whey protein. And this company, Brave Robot, makes ice cream from it, which is pretty cool. Then we've got films. So this, going from mushrooms to mycelium and now a little smaller, we have um, the biopolymer chitin. And this is what's found in the fungal cell wall. You can extract this from fungus, although most of the time, if you see chitin or chitosan in the material world, it's coming from shrimp shells or other like seafood crustacean byproduct stuff. And this stuff is really inexpensive. You can get like pounds of it for dollars. And it's a great material. I've worked with it a couple times and it's a very auspicious bioplastic like material. Um, but you can also get it from fungi. And there's few companies who are doing that. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do it from fungi, but you can. And we are going in the direction of a world that's a little more plant-based or non-animal based. So um, I ordered a few of the chitosan extractions from a fungi. There's a company in China that's doing it. And you know, it worked just as well as the shrimp or um, shellfish materials. And the stuff you see on the right is done by Sasha Fishman. She's a good friend of mine who's worked with chitosan a lot. So I encourage you to check out her website. She's an artist and, you know, in, into bio art in general and um, has probably done the most experimentation DIY style with chitosan that, that I know of. And um, it's great. You, you can get a lot of interesting properties from it just by adding crosslinkers or, um, you know, other chemicals that encourage softening and stuff like that. The photo on the left is something that I created with aspergillus chitosan, which is a mold. Um, and yeah, you know, crustaceans, exoskeletons, shellfish, and mushrooms, that's where you're going to find this stuff. And then you take off the acetyl, acetyl group and you get chitosan. And you can get really clear stuff too. So this is one that I made, um, a water soluble one. And that was probably the clearest film that I was, I've ever made from Kaidazan. Um, so it's exciting. I think there's a lot of potential with this biopolymer and I really want to see it more in the bioplastics world and just, you know, the, the biotech in general. And getting even smaller, chemicals. So as we talked about before, fungi are master metabolizers. Most of their genome that has the uh, information to create enzymes is not expressed unless they are prompted by the environment to express it. So there's a few companies, one I can think of in the UK called Hypha Discovery. And what they do is they take a fungus, they give it a food that it's never encountered before or seemingly is, is foreign to them from their natural environment and it will start to express different enzymes and those enzymes might have properties that are useful to us and they're you know discovering these different metabolites so it definitely requires some more advanced equipment to like really screen for this stuff but the point is like these fungi have such a dense genetic code for chemicals that it's so warranted to explore it. And I chose this picture because uh, this is Pinellas stipticus that had some contamination and that little droplet you see here, that's a bunch of enzymes all put together. And I was just thinking like, what's going on here? You know, there's like an antifungal enzyme against this contaminant but something that's specific to that fungus and not itself. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's really understudied and um, it's exciting. There's a few people that are beginning to really like explore this stuff and commercialize it. Microma is an example. These people are in Argentina 
and I went through the Indie Bio, and uh, they're using a penicillin mold. So this is like a really basic fungus you find growing on bread, things like that. Um, and they are making pigments out of it, and that's a metabolite. So they grow it in a bioreactor, um, and the longer it grows, the redder the, the broth gets. And that pigment is um, safe. You know, it's better than what most of the companies are using, uh, like red food dyes. It's not nearly as toxic. And um, they're noticing that it'll work for a variety of things, not just like food products, but cosmetics, um, even like textile dyes and things like that. So, Questions? Okay. Uh, also in the pigment world, there's the stuff called xylandin. We have a culture over here at the Odin. This is a um, blue stain fungus. Rarely you'll see the mushrooms. You'll much more often see these, these blue pieces of wood uh, hiking if you're in the Northeast or Northwest and there's really lush uh, forests. Keep an eye out for this. It's probably more abundant than you think. I saw it all over Massachusetts, New York, um, Connecticut, Virginia, and it's definitely found in the North uh, West as well. But this stuff is really cool. It's used to dye so many things. Like the, the people who are working with this are at Oregon State right now, and it's a spalting fungus, which basically just means a fungus that colonizes a wood and produces a pigment and woodworkers love it. So if you've seen like spalted wood working before, there's these black zone lines that go through the wood, that's a fungus. And um, all it is, is is pigments, you know? Um, so it's really exciting to have like these woodworkers, these artists really get super focused in on this fungal characteristic and start to discover some interesting things. So one of the people on their team um, is this guy, Grant, and he, their team is studying xylandin as a semiconductor. This is just a molecule that's naturally occurring within this blue fungus. So, you know, you never know what you're going to find. Um, and yeah, it's exciting stuff. The picture on the right is stuff that's I made in, at the Odin, so I have this log that's just blue, you know, completely or mo mostly colonized with um, chloricoboria, that's the Latin name of this fungus. We soaked it in um, dimethyl dichloromethane, and that solvent takes out all the pigment, um, and then now you've got it. And it's it's been really fun to play with and start, like, coloring glasses and stones and, and metals and things like that. Sherwin-Williams, the paint company even, was considering using this stuff uh, to replace a lot of their blue pigments, blue and green pigments. But most of this is still so nascent. So another fun application has been the bitter blocker. So this comes from a company called Mycotechnology. It's got a cute story. There were these chefs who were fermenting tempeh with different funguses. And one of the fungi that they tried to do tempeh with was um, a cordyceps species. So they ate the tempeh and they realized that their mouths were different, like food tasted differently after eating this tempeh. And uh, the more they looked into it, they realized that there was a compound produced by the fungus that bound to the bitter receptor on your tongue. And this is commercialized now. You can purchase what they call clear taste and add it to your foods. So the idea is that you use less sugar in your food uh, because there's less bitter things to negate or to neutralize if um, you add clear taste, which just, you know, softens the bitter taste altogether. And this is a year behind, a year old, but I think of all the, the biotech people that are out there working with specifically something fungal, 
these are great examples. Um, you know, I encourage you to just like look into this. If this is something that you're interested in and you want to be part of, look into these companies. You know, they might be near you. You might be able to go tour their facilities. Um, I've been surprised with the openness of a lot of these companies. And yeah, I think it'll just show you the potentials of what fungi can do. Um, like I said, it's extremely nascent, but I keep finding novel ways that people are working with fungi and um, it's pretty great. So I wonder if these blue fungi are UV reactive. Uh, what do you mean by UV reactive, Keith? Um, also, in the notes, these show notes, there there are like this stuff that if you are interested in, um, go to the Google Classroom, check out the notes, and there'll be like YouTube links, like an interview with Greg here, um, publications to the papers that I've mentioned, protocols even. So there's a lot that's involved in the, the slides. Um, and now we're going to discuss a bit of genetic engineering, because that's what the ODIN does. And they... No, they do not glow, as far as I know. I haven't checked. Um, they're not fluorescent. OK. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting because yeasts are a model organism in the biotech world. And we know how to engineer them. But there is very little literature out there that discusses fungal cell or mycelial engineering. And why is that? Like part of it, of course, is because no one's really doing it. There's not a great reason. You know, when people are engineering yeast, they're doing like molecular farming and they're trying to get specific proteins uh, from that. They're, you know, and that's a great organism to work with. There's no reason to work with a filamentous fungus to attempt to make, you know, a specific protein or um, a lot of the things that people are using yeast for. Like even, THC, people are um, using yeast to make cannabis constituents because then you don't have to farm the plant. You can just grow the yeast in a bioreactor, filter out the THC, the CBD, whatever it is you're looking for, and it's a lot more efficient. But um, I would still love to see people start to engineer with mycelium. And there's a few reasons other than the fact that it's so nascent and there's not a lot of literature out there that it's a little more difficult. And um, from what I was reading, you know, the the fungal cell has, in the basidiomycete family and the ones that like, we would be interested in engineering, not the yeast, not the molds, but the mushrooms, you know, things on this scale. There's two nuclei per cell. And that's tough because as you see in the yeast, there's one. And when you're doing a lot of these applications like CRISPR, um, electroporation, agrobacterium, all of the methods for genetic engineering, there's just these extra hurdles. I've found a variety of papers that have successfully engineered things like Ganoderma, Pleurotus, both of which are in the kit that you got. Um, and they'll be included in the notes here. So we'll start experimenting with it. We'll let you know how it goes. We'll add protocols to it. Um, but it's definitely not as easy as a copy paste from yeast to mycelium. Um, and here's just a picture. I thought it'd be great to show you like what the cell division looks like and all of the fun fungi that you got in your kit. Um, these are from the basidiomycota phylum. So they have what's called clamp connections. And you can see they kind of do this like leapfrog situation where they divide their nuclei and then it just insert it in this um, order. So does anyone have questions? Because we are going to transition to the demo and I'm going to show you what to do with um, your reishi once it's done, once it's uh, colonized enough. Okay. So, 
So, here's something I noticed and that would be really fun for you guys to experiment with. If you uh, were to put like a chopstick or something into your reishi bag, a reishi block like this, once it's grown out, um, I don't know if you can see, it grew around this wire and I originally put this here to keep the bags far away from the mushrooms because if you don't, they'll kind of grow up against it and create like this flat morphology. Um, and then I went away for the weekend and it started to kind of encapsulate the wire and I'm just letting it go. Um, and there's a lot of things you can do. Like it doesn't have to be a woody material. You can add like really any clean structure to this bag and the reishi will use it. You know, kind of like plants to um, climb up surfaces and it's pretty exciting. Okay. Has anybody inoculated a grain bag yet? I'm just curious, or sorry, has anyone inoculated a um, brick? So when you add the, the hot water to the brick and then you add the grain, anyone's done that? I imagine most of your stuff wasn't ready by then, but. What we're gonna show you today is um, after you've grown your grain out on those bricks, you're gonna let it colonize for about a week or two until there's some structure to it. And then you can take that material, that substrate, break it up, and um, put it into a secondary one. So if you want to grow your Ganoderma off a, or out of a vase instead of a bag, um, just looks more pleasing, then I'm gonna show you how to do that. Um, so here's an example of one, and it's starting to grow through the filter patch. I'm just kind of letting this one run as well because, um, you know, I'm trying to get to know the fungus and see how we can push the limits with, um, sort of sculpting this stuff. Grain isn't ready yet, yeah. Okay. So, First thing I'm going to show you is what to do with your starch. So in the media kit bags, you got a small bag of starch. Once your bag of colonized brick has grown out for about one to two weeks, you're going to start seeing, you know, mycelium like this. It's not completely grown out, but um, you're, you're seeing a good amount of it. For Pinellus stipticus and for the Ganoderma, add some starch. It will quicken the growth and uh, with the Pinellus stipticus it will glow brighter and last longer. So as usual, use some gloves, wipe down your area, wear a mask, um, all that good stuff. You know, be a good fungus farmer. The reason we're adding starch later and not at the beginning is um, because it's less susceptible to contamination. So we're not sterilizing those blocks when you add hot water. What's happening is you're basically just pasteurizing something that's already been heat treated. But there's definitely still microbes living in there. So you want the fungus to sort of claim the substrate before you give it extra food because if there was too many simple sugars, things like bacteria and other mold spores might, you know, germinate and um, take advantage of that. But when it's just the brick, when it's just like tough cellulose and lignin, there's not many microorganisms that are going to thrive on that type of material. So allowing the fungus to take off and like really get its cells in a variety of places and um, get some defensive chemistry going, then you can start adding supplementation and not be so concerned that you're going to get contamination. But yeah, just, you know, look for, um, I would say like 20% colonization. The bag should have some give. So when you made the brick 
bag and don't 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 have any fungus in it, it's gonna be really like you know, it'll break up really easily like this. But after the fungus starts to colonize, there's some structure to it. Because it's basically gluing all that stuff together with its with its cells. And that's about where you wanna be when you add the starch. So what I'm gonna do is break up this material a bit. And after you do this, you typically see the mycelium take off pretty fast. Um, there's a few ways you can do this. You can add the starch to water and then add the water to the bag. And I would recommend doing that if your bag seems super dry. Uh, but if you did a 1.7 times water to brick, like in the protocol, the moisture level should be pretty great. Um, you know, it does depend, like, environment to environment, though, and fungus to fungus. So just use your judgment. If it seems really dry and you're like, the color is a little brighter and not so dark, then consider adding water. But generally, for these bricks and the amount of water we have you add, you won't need to do that. How do I cut those bricks? We had to use a saw, we used a skill saw. Um, Want to ask which ways it can be used to heal nervous system and can it be at all? Um, so there is a fungus, lion's mane, that's, you know, in the, the medicinal mushroom world known to be supportive to that, to your nervous system. All right, in your kit, you got about two spoonfuls of tapioca. I've done this so much that I don't even measure anymore. I just, just sprinkle it on. With this kind of nutri supplement, it's not like you're gonna poison the fungus if you overdo it. If you're adding like inorganic nitrogens or something, um, you would wanna be mindful about the amount that you're adding. Um, but something like starch, I don't bother. I just kind of sprinkle on what, appears to be about two tablespoons and yeah it's just kind of like insta food for the fungus so i like to get the starch in there trap the air a little bit so there's like some space to really shake it uh, and eventually once you shake it enough the starch should not be visible anymore. And it'll just look like a bag of dirt like this. And that's what you want. Um, and then tie it off again. Uh, you can use zip ties. I prefer rubber bands because I can use them. And then you want to incubate it again. So that's just going to be a dark space. Um, Room temperature is fine, but you know, I use, I just put mine in a box. You can put it in the closet. It doesn't matter if it's exposed to light for a few minutes a day, um, but the darkness will definitely help with um, the initial colonization. So after you do that, after you add the starch, your bricks should take off pretty quick. Um, It'll probably be another week or two until you get something that looks like this. And then um, with the Ganoderma, the timing is really important. If you go too far, you're going to be wrestling with a brick that's like really difficult to break up with your hands. Like you would have to use a grinder. And then once you get that involved, it's just the amount of effort is hardly worth it. And um, it also creates opportunity to be uh, open to contamination. So having something in this stage where there's still some give is great. Um, and it's also not fruiting yet. So if you were to take a bag like this and it had some mushroom fruits and then you broke it all up and put it into another vase, it's not gonna be as, as hardy. Um, so just check on your fungus like every day, you know? And you'll develop like a sixth sense almost for um, their stages and what to do with them. 
far. What you want to do is break it up pretty good. And maybe before you do that, you can clean out the vessel that you want to add it to. So I already sprayed this out down with isopropyl. There's still some in there. Um, but you know, wipe it down, let it evaporate, because if there is some alcohol left here and then you add the substrate, it'll kill all of the cells that get that make contact with that alcohol. And um, that wouldn't be good. So make sure that it's dried off really well. Can I add chitosan like you add starch? That's, I've never tried that. Um, I don't imagine it, I mean, the starch is great because it's, it's a sugar and it's really easy for the fungus to digest. Uh, with chitosan, yes, fungi produce chitinase, but only when they really need to. And um, I, yeah, but I encourage you to try it. You know, I give my fungus weird food all the time just to see what happens. Got it broken out. And I would also look at the amount of substrate you have in advance and see how much you can make. You know, you might want to use um, another jar or two. And that's also going to be important because you only have four filter bags, so you'll reuse this one as your tent, uh, as your humidity tent. Could you write or repeat the name of the medicinal mushroom? Uh, sure, Adrian. I'll type it in the chat. And this is still has some alcohol in it, so I'm just going to wipe it down real quick. And I've had some people express concern before when they have a fully colonized bag and then they break it up and they don't see any mycelium anymore. That's totally normal. It does like feel like you're killing everything and you don't see the white anymore. Um, but trust me, once you add it to this new vessel, um, it's pretty impressive how fast this stuff takes off. got a good aggregate, you know, break it up as best you can. Um, spray it on your hands because you will want to touch the substrate. I'm going to have you pack it down. I did a test to see did the mushrooms fruit better loose or packed, and it was definitely with um, packed down substrate, so your hands will be involved. You know, you can um, just dump it. Down. Not too hard, but just enough. Another thing I wanted to point out, like having air pockets like this, you can go in and, and fill them in, but I kind of like having them because it creates really interesting mycelial patterns. And I'll show you some examples in a little bit. Another thing you want to keep in mind is how high up the substrate goes. So if your stuff stopped here, the mushrooms will grow up alongside the glass. And that might or might not be something that you want. Um, I tend to like them to not do that and just like fruit from the surface flush with the glass. But yeah, this is about what you want it to look like. And 
for your own stuff at home, um, you can get new filter bags, but you have you can reuse this too. So I would encourage you to put this material in another jar or whatever glass vessel you have, and um, then put this inside of the filter bag. Since I don't have another vessel with me right now, I'm just gonna use, um, I'll use a used one, how about that? To show you that it's totally allowed to reuse your filter bag. Um, but this is gonna create that high CO2 and humidity tank. So, spritz it with a little bit of water, not too much enough you know basically get the bag to look a little sweaty because when you, when you tie it off that humidity is going to last for a while there you have it uh now all you really need is patience you know over the course of a week this will start to turn white and then you'll start to see mushrooms probably within a week or two. Um, especially if you did the supplementation step. Uh, because like I said before, these bricks, they're just like basic hardwood bricks. The company actually uses different wood species all the time. And uh, fungi have preferences, you know. So reishi does really great on oak and soy. I don't know if there's any oak in here, if there is how much, um, but you can really encourage healthy fruiting just with uh, supplementation. So, yeah. That demo also works for Pinellas stipticus. So if you want to put your glowing mushroom in like right now I have this cutesy apple shaped thing and there's no stipticus in here and it glows really well. Um, it's slowly growing down and the glow gets a little bit deeper every time. But yeah, put them into jars, put them in whatever, as long as there's an airway to breathe. So you can make your own if you want to, like drilling a hole in a lid and adding like pillow stuffing or polyfill. That's a way to like hack it, um, but also a cork. I've surprisingly used glass vessels with a cork at the top and that allowed um, a good amount of fresh air exchange for the Pinellas stipticus to glow. Um, yeah, you know, here's a, an example of the ratio that was packed versus loose. It's really hard to see through the back, but um, the mushroom formation happened almost two weeks in advance um, with more densely packed substrate. And sometimes you might get interesting things like this, where it's only fruiting from the corner. So ways to kind of like encourage the fungus to grow from the specific spot. Um, if you cover the top with something like saran wrap and then poke a hole, uh, you can get it to like almost force it to have to go through that route rather than the edges because the mushrooms are gonna fruit in ideal microclimates and like there's just, it's a headache to consider dealing with that and trying to get the humidity just right without um, like a proper fruiting chamber. And if all you have is a filter bag, um, that's a way to, Kind of packet. Um, here's one that I'm trying. I don't know if you can see. There's saran wrap on top, and then I've got holes poked where I want the mushrooms to come from. And you'll see a lot of different things happen. Um, if you were to open your bag every now and then, you'll probably get like little. You know, I wasn't too happy with one way this one turned out, but. They'll antler up like this and then fan out uh, when there's higher oxygen. So experiment, play with it. The Odin's also going to start offering just like a grow your own 
mushroom sculpture kit, and that's going to come with a pre-colonized bag of substrate that we've been working on to get the mushrooms to grow really big, really strong. And um, if, so if you want to play with that more, we'll, we'll offer it. But you can also use the methods that you learned in this class to grow your own. The culture that you have, um, you, you could save it, you know, if you used only half of your culture syringe to inoculate the uh, grain, keep it in the fridge. You can continue propagating that pretty much indefinitely. Um, if you do ever want new cultures and you took this class, just let me know. And for the cost of shipping, we'll send them to you. Um, or if you want recommendations on where to find other ones, uh, they'll be in the classroom. The final week will have um, a ton of supply lists and things like that. And definitely keep an eye out for um, the Google Classroom because there's gonna be a lot of stuff that's added to week three. We've been adding it like a couple days after the class itself. So, um, you know, look into it. Does anyone else have Questions before we say goodbye? Does not seem like, yes, Adrian? How should we autoclave wood pieces we find outside? Um, Yes, it, well, it depends. If you're doing like log cultivation with the with the dowel rods, you don't have to, uh, but it's gonna take a couple years to see stuff. Um, but yeah, you can grind those up, uh, saw them up, whatever, and I would autoclave them or pressure cook them, definitely. Can you use fungus to make your hair better? <laughs> I'm sure there's someone out there selling, actually in China they have, um, Ganoderma in their shampoo. So, couldn't hurt. Experience with fruiting bags versus buckets, pros and cons. So, David, we, yeah, we didn't talk about buckets, but that's another like very DIY, easy way to grow mushrooms. And there'll be protocols for this in the classroom. Um, there's all sorts of information about this online, but buckets are great. You tend to get more flushes from it. You can also reuse them. Um, but it totally depends on what you're growing. If you're growing oysters, for example, buckets are fantastic. Um, but if you're growing like Ganoderma, Pinellas stipticus, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, it's just a little more difficult to keep environmental conditions in check. And for something as responsive as Ganoderma and Pinellas stipticus, uh, the buckets can be, yeah, they can, they can be difficult. But the bags are good <clears throat> because they're sterile. Um, you can have a little more control over the fresh air exchange. And uh, yeah. So yeah, Ben, the, the stream will be published on YouTube so you can have it um, forever. And there's all sorts of stuff I've added to the Google Classroom too. Like there's a protocol to grow oyster mushrooms off of cardboard. That's in the protocol. We didn't go over it in class, but it's really easy. Basically you take an oyster mushroom from the store, wrap it in some wet cardboard and it'll just take off and uh, start growing some stuff. So, you know, definitely check it out. Like we've, we've beefed up the Google Classroom quite a bit um, and there's more stuff that'll be added day to day. Uh, there will be eventually a Mycology 201 um, where we hopefully discuss some genetic engineering and you know, more interesting applications than just how to cultivate and grow them. So, and again, if anyone needs new cultures, wants new cultures, and you took the class, email me for the cost of shipping. We can send those to you. And yeah, keep me posted because even if you did the demos at the same time as our classrooms, 
you are not going to see any mushrooms yet. It'll be like a couple months, especially for the Pinellas dip, because if you see mushrooms for that, it's going to be probably a good four months until something really fruits, but it should glow, you know, right away. Your grain spawn should be glowing. Um, and keep me posted because we want to know how this is working for you guys. You're the first people to take the materials that we put together into the as a kit and, and propagate it outside of the Odin. I've never um, heard of anyone using the fire bricks before for these purposes. So I'd really like to know how it's working out um, and how we can help you be successful with mushroom growing. And yeah, I'm going to end the stream. Thanks so much. You'll get a follow-up email from me later today and uh, good luck with everything.